Good evening, folks. Welcome to the quantum machine learning panel discussion. My name is Terrell France. Uh, let me walk you through a few slides before we introduce our, our panelists. Uh, tonight is uh, presented by, uh, sponsored by Cambridge Quantum Computing, Association Quantum, and Harrisburg University. And the whole event has been organized by the Washington Quantum, Quantum Meetup Group in uh, Washington, DC. Uh, here's a, if you're interested in uh, Association Quantum, here's some, uh, a, a email for you to reach out to them. Uh, there are a couple events coming up sponsored by Association Quantum and Washington, DC, I believe, the Washington Meetup Group. Uh, one coming up uh, on May 14th, that's tomorrow night, or tomorrow uh, afternoon, morning, at 11.30 a.m. Eastern. And on Saturday, May 16th at noon, we have a, another uh, event coming up, a webinar. And yours truly uh, will be uh, hosting a tutorial session on co complex numbers on Thursday evening, May 21st. So let me stop that and we'll get to work here. So I'll introduce our panelists in order of their opening monologue. Uh, Vinay Pandness is a uh, freelance programmer and co a contributor to many open source projects. Uh, today, he's constructed eight online Udemy courses, including courses such as Neural Network Trading Bot, AI TensorFlow Machine Learning, Cloud Computing for Machine Learning, and of course, Quantum Computing Theory to Simulation and Programming. I believe Vignet is somewhere out on the Indian subcontinent right now, tonight, or I think it's around 4.30 his time. So welcome, Vinay. Uh, after Vinay, next up will be Michael Brett. Michael's the Senior Vice President of Applications at Rigetti Computing, where he landed after his company QX branch, where he was CEO, was acquired by Rigetti in July of last year. And looking deeper into his background, it seems he has a hidden history in aerospace avionics. Uh, so clearly his path from aviation to quantum is worthy of some additional discussion sometime. Welcome, Michael. And our third panelist tonight is Yanni uh, Gambros, who's the head of business development at QCWare. Yanni joined QCWare after nearly 10 years at IBM, and he also was at uh, ILOG for a few years. He holds a PhD in operations research from University of Maryland. And as Iani is the business develop in business development, I feel obliged to uh, plug the Q2B conference run by QCWare. If you're not aware of the conference, it's a three to four day quantum event in San Jose, California. Hopefully it's live uh, and it's, it'll be held this coming December. And if you want more information, certainly uh, Google Q2B uh, for more information. So welcome, Yanni. And for my part as moderator for tonight, my name is Terrell France and I am a professor at Harrisburg University. So the, the format for tonight will involve each panelist giving a monologue, a short monologue perhaps, uh, to get the conversation started. Uh, I will plan to read off any questions from the chat as it feels comfortable. So any questions that you might have, uh, please enter them into the, into the chat. So after the three uh, complete their, their opening comments, we'll get a conversation going, and hopefully it's an interactive discussion uh, with the panelists, uh, not only amongst themselves, but uh, amongst all of us here uh, in the broadcast. So uh, this event is being recorded, so keep that in mind for all the usual reasons. So let's get started. Vinay, it's all yours. Hey, Terrell, like, thanks for introducing. So let me first share my screen.
Okay. So essentially, hi everyone. I am Vinay, and I'll basically be introducing and setting up the playing field for uh, quantum machine learning. The main focus here is to just give you a very brief introduction of what exactly is quantum machine learning and like why should you be concerned about it and what are some underlying technologies behind it. And then after that, uh, I'll share you something that I'm working on. And with that, we can take this discussion ahead. So with this, first of all, uh, let me quickly go through the machine learning cycle. So essentially, if you have a program and that program is having some sort of machine learning built into it, then essentially you are doing that in four different phases. So the first phase is where you guess some output. So considering you have a neural network, then first it makes a guess. Then this guess is evaluated based on what is the actual output that is expected. So something like a loss value is calculated. Then after calculating a loss value, some sort of training is done. And after doing this training, then again, a loss value for a different data set, which is called the testing data set is calculated. And then again, the neural network makes a guess. So the idea is these guesses become better and better as the number of iterations go on increasing. So essentially, this is the standard workflow in any machine learning program. So now we need to understand what exactly is the role of quantum here, then how can quantum provide a boost to some, uh, if not all of these processes and how can we exactly leverage quantum machine learning to solve some uh, real life problems. Okay, so essentially with this, first of all, let's look at what are some bottlenecks in the current machine learning systems. So Essentially, first of all, if you want to train a machine learning model, then this training is usually done by something called as gradient descent. And the gradient descent algorithm heavily relies on finding the minimum of any particular function. So essentially, the idea is you create a loss function and you want to find the minimum of this loss function. So to do that, in order to find the direction in which you want to move your parameters. So in the case of a neural network, there are different weights and biases. So in order to configure these parameters and to actually generate some result on the output side, then you need to essentially get a sense of direction. So will the accuracy increase by decreasing this parameter or increasing it? So this sort of directionality needs to be calculated. So essentially the very first bottleneck in any machine learning system is that calculating derivatives and partial derivatives is sometimes computationally expensive. And this is a big part of the computation cost of any machine learning model in the training phase. Then the second part is performing this sort of directional analysis. Uh, requires a lot of different derivative calls. So essentially, uh, by this, I what I mean that if you want to calculate, if you want to find out the direction of analyzing a particular parameter or tweaking a particular parameter, then you need to calculate derivatives at different points and then get a sense of the exact direction. Then one more very different, very important bottleneck in a machine learning system is that it can get stuck at a local minima rather than a global minimum. So essentially, if you have trained a machine learning model, then sometimes you come across uh, the situation where your loss is not decreasing, but the model is actually giving out a constant loss value. And this is because it has been bottled down in a local minima. So the loss can further be decreased down, but essentially the main idea is that uh, overall gradient descent in in the entirety should actually take you to a global minimum. So with this, like uh, I've completed a quick two minute introduction of what exactly is the machine learning cycles and what are some of the bottlenecks in this cycle, which sometimes cause these huge training times. So some models can literally be trained for weeks or even months together. 
so this delay or this uh, high computation cost in training of any machine learning model is mostly related to these factors so then let's look at what exactly is quantum and how do you actually leverage quantum so essentially i am planning on keeping this a very high level uh, introduction so that uh, we everyone has a good understanding of where should uh, quantum be used in machine learning or ai and then what sort of advantages and disadvantages are we having with that approach okay so over here let's take an example so this is a concept which i have co i've coined as directional computing so essentially if you have a hot cup of coffee and you keep it out in the open for some time then essentially what you notice is that after some time it starts uh, losing energy and the temperature of that cup of coffee essentially slowly starts matching the temp the room temperature of that particular environment similarly on the other hand if you have a cold cup of coffee then it starts gaining energy the temperature increases and slowly it matches the room temperature so now there is some sort of directionality going on so a hot cup of coffee knows that it has to decrease its energy energy level and a cold cup of coffee somehow knows that it has to increase its energy level so essentially nature has this sort of directionality built in and this particular directionality is called as thermal equilibrium in this particular case so now then if you are further away from the room temperature then the rate at which you lose heat uh, increases exponentially so essentially this is called as the newton's law of cooling but the point which i want to get across here is that in nature almost each and every object has a inherent property of achieving the lowest possible energy state in that particular environment so with this quantum computers take advantage of this same phenomena where you can create different circuits and ultimately you look at the lowest energy state so ultimately the goal over here is to somehow map a loss function on a quantum circuit and then come up with the lowest possible loss value at any given instant okay so now this phenomena is also called as natural gradient descent and quantum computers achieve this sort of natural gradient descent by using something called as quantum tunneling uh, by which essentially means that they can scan the entire solution space at any given instant and come up with the lowest value for any given function which is mapped on the quantum circuit so now uh, some essential questions like how do we map this particular uh, circuit or, or how do we map a particular function on a quantum circuit then we will be answer we will be coming at these questions shortly but for now let's look at what are the uh, very high level steps that are required in order to solve something using quantum machine learning okay so the very first step is that you need to analyze a problem so essentially in this case you need to convert the problem into any sort of mathematical model so now this can uh, have two different outcomes so it can be very easy where you have something which is converted into just a simple set of linear equations or it can be very difficult where you need to create a lot of different eigen values and eigen vector matrices or you need to create different binary binary constraint satisfaction problems together so this step can be either simple or very complicated then the second part is you need to translate this sort of mathematical model and then translate it to something which is called as a set of circuits so essentially a mathematical model can then be converted to a set of operations which can then be executed on a quantum computer and then the final stage is to run the program on a quantum computer and to make sure that we run the program enough number of times that we don't have any unexpected outputs so essentially this is a very important task and right now step number 1 is a very big hurdle 
so if you look at simple machine learning problems then it is very easy to create a, a five layer network using keras uh, which has a tensorflow backend but it is very hard to deploy it on a quantum computer okay so with this uh, a very practical approach is that mostly we use a hybrid computing approach so part of the machine learning is uh, done using a classical machine learning program and a remaining part of that particular machine learning optimization is done on a quantum hardware so sometimes we also use a hybrid computing approach and again this is because of the limitations in quantum systems so creating a quantum computer is very hard because you need to achieve constraints like near absolute zero temperature then very uh, very low pressure so really kudos to the people who create quantum computers i guess we have a few on the panel today but creating a, compu a quantum computer is a very difficult task and currently we are limited by the accuracy and the results produced by the current quantum computing hardware so sometimes having a hybrid machine learning approach can also be beneficial okay so then let's just look at something which was happening in the machine learning domain a few years back so essentially we had different solutions for a lot of these different problems so if we had a problem which was referring to computer vision then in that case we were using convolutional neural networks and the entire approach of handling a computer vision problem was very different uh, or was very uh, complicated as compared to something like natural language processing or device optimization based on ml so essentially we had different ways of solving every small problem in the machine learning space but slowly as neural networks took off and the deep learning revolution began then we started to see more and more unified approaches to solve any particular problem so essentially now almost each and every machine learning system use a neural network in some way there might be different uh, connection types like something like a recurrent neural network or a transformer where they have different connection types but ultimately everything uses some sort of neural network if it is a deep learning system then if you look at some problem specific aspects then natural language processing and computer vision or image net or even a uh, recurrent neural network for that matter they have a similar architecture though the working is different but still we have one unified solution so in the case of machine learning this unifying factor was the creation of neural networks so after neural networks were created then the entire machine learning space kind of collapsed into one simple problem which was how do you create more powerful neural networks and how do you train them properly so similarly in the quantum computing landscape or the quantum machine learning landscape what we are seeing right now is that there are different tools to solve each and every problem so if you have computer vision on a quantum computer if you want to simulate like generative adversarial networks on a quantum computer if you want to perform some sort of quantum optimization using a quantum computer then for each of these tasks there is a different approach which you need to take so according to me this is something which really needs to be worked on at this moment so if for uh, if by some uh, sort of mechanism we could come up with a different thinking process for simulating problems on a quantum computer and essentially have one single architectural approach in order to solve any problem the substance in that approach might vary but essentially the idea is to use a similar architecture to solve every machine learning problem and this is something which i am working on so what i'm working on is actually building a higher level api like keras on top of tensorflow and this api can directly interact with some quantum hardware so as of now the source code is not yet released i will be releasing that in 
some amount of time so if you are interested in contributing in this then feel free to get in touch with me but right now let me just explain the overall working of this higher level api so essentially we have different machine learning libraries like tensorflow and we have quantum hardware so this higher level api takes advantage of both of these domains and it generates a trained machine learning model then this trained machine learning model can be used to retrain the circuit which is present on the quantum hardware or to tweak the circuit which is present on the quantum hardware or it can be used to generate some inferences so essentially the main idea over here is that writing code in tensorflow is very easy but then porting it on a quantum computer and executing this same code on a quantum computer is very difficult as of now so this is why i thought that there was a need to create this sort of high level api which is that it inherently uses a similar architecture for every machine learning program so let me just quickly get into the detail of what exactly does this higher level api do so essentially if you have even if you have any sort of neural network as the input then it is taken layer by layer and then each one of these layers is fed to a quantum computer but now before feeding a layer to a quantum computer you need to take in some factors into consideration so the size of any neural network layer can be vastly different but the number of qubits which are available on a quantum system are always constant for that given experiment so now what i did was that we took this neural network and then converted it into a sort of 3d map in the entire data space so again this is something which we had to create from the scratch because mapping a neural network on a 3d data space and then by mapping this on a 3d data space then we started to create transformers so essentially this is a similar type of model which is used in speech recognition natural language processing and then Uh, by using these sort of transformers we convert this 3d map into a binary model then that binary model is converted to an operation matrix so this is done by using some convolutional layers so that everything fits on the exact number of qubits that we have on a quantum hardware and then finally we convert it to circuits and then it is deployed on a quantum computer so with this uh, let's look at what exactly have we achieved then even if you give it any sort of neural network as the input then it can generate a quantum mapping based on this particular input and then the only factor which is limiting in this case is the number of qubits on that particular computing system and this even makes sense because the more number of qubits that you have the more number of uh, calculations or the higher accuracy you can generate with this particular approach and this makes sense with the reality that we are experiencing right now which is that the more processing power that you have usually it translates to higher accuracy so then each uh, like every conversion over here is handled by a pre-trained network for that similar type of approach so essentially let let's quickly go through this higher level api so first of all it takes it takes tensorflow code so essentially if you create a neural network using tensorflow it takes that as the input then it performs some sort of translation operations on it and this is not easy so mapping a neural network on like as a quantum circuit is something which seems to be very disconnected but this is where a pre-trained network comes into picture so the task over here was already training a neural network so that it can generate a good mapping from what exactly is the input neural network and then map it on a quantum hardware okay and then there are also some aspects like keeping some state vectors in the entire quantum domain so that 
we have different neural networks or different layers in the same network connected to each other so essentially we need some solutions like these in order to truly uh, excel in the quantum machine learning landscape okay so with this uh, this is pretty much it for my monologue if you have any uh, questions then feel free to go ahead with it then a let me uh, let me pass on two quick questions uh first one is how do, your project here how does it differ differ from the tensorflow quantum in that uh, we believe that tensorflow quantum uh, nodes can work in a hybrid environment or a hybrid network rather yeah so one key difference over here is that the entire uh, conversion over here is actually handled by a pre-trained network and the reason why this is important is that uh, sometimes uh, like tensorflow nodes can uh, cannot perform efficiently on some sort of quantum hardware given some different input conditions so essentially what i mean by this is that tensorflow gives you a way of mapping a single neuron on a quantum hardware and then also getting the loss value or even training it on a quantum hardware but if you really want to solve some higher level tasks like computer vision or even speech analysis for that matter and then some further higher level tasks like uh, talking about encryption using quantum computers then uh, talking about reality simulation then essentially the main key difference over here is that each one of this translation step is handled by a pre-trained neural network which actually is evaluated based on how well is the quantum computer performing for that particular task so essentially the more this particular framework is used then the model learns to map it in a better way so instead of a constant mapping uh, this mapping is handled by a pre-trained network Okay, let me ask you a quick one and uh, then we'll pass it over to Michael. Uh, in your project, do you use any quantum oracles? Yeah, so as of now, uh, this project is still in its infancy. So uh, what we are doing is we are just creating proof of concepts that an approach like this would uh, vastly outperform anything that is present out there. So right now we are just using quantum simulators in order to uh, like deploy something on a quantum hardware. So instead of a, di a direct quantum computer, we are using a quantum simulator. Okay, there's more questions coming in uh, as expected, but uh, let's uh, hold off on those questions and we'll get over to Michael. Thank you, Vinay. Michael? Yeah, thank you. Terrell, thank you very much and uh, great to be here. And uh, Vinay, thanks very much for that uh, really great introduction to the, the concepts. Uh, <clears throat> so I thought I'd, I'd just give some opening remarks to introduce uh, Rigetti as a company and then some of the considerations that, that we go through as a hardware provider uh, in trying to make available the best possible systems that we can uh, to the folks that are developing uh, software and in particular machine learning. Uh, packages. Um, so for those that aren't familiar with Rigetti, we are a, um, a full stack quantum computing uh, provider. The company was founded in 2013 by Chad Rigetti uh, to build uh, superconducting quantum computing systems. And so for the past seven years or so, the company has been working uh, through the, the invention and the innovation and the bringing to market of uh, uh, superconducting quantum computers. Uh, similar in architecture to the way that uh, Google and IBM build theirs, but of course uh, there's, there's a few arch architectural differences that we make, um, and bringing those to market. Um, so it was in November 2017 that Rigetti uh, launched its uh, quantum cloud service, or QCS, uh, where we put a, uh, one of our quantum computers into the cloud and made it available to users uh, for the first time. And over the past uh, two and a bit years, um, we've been opening up more and more access to, to those systems and uh, encouraging more and more users to uh, come on board and start making use of, of the platforms that we build. 
Uh, and it's really important for us to make those systems available to end users and, and researchers because that drives the innovation loop uh, at Rigetti. We need the input from uh, the end users and the kind of applications that they're looking at to help us inform the choices that we're making uh, into the hardware systems for, for each iteration that we go through. Um, so our, our latest system, uh, it's called Aspen 7. Uh, it was launched on, on our cloud service uh, in November last year. Uh, so it's been active for about six months now, um, and it's been a, a just a, a fantastic workhorse for us. Um, the the uptime's been been fantastic, well over ninety five percent uptime uh, on that system, uh, and uh, lots of users uh, making use of it every day. It's a twenty eight qubit device uh, that sits in a, a lattice layout. Um, it's a thirty two qubit layout, but twenty eight of those qubits are, are active at the moment. Uh, with about a 95% uh, two qubit gate fidelity on there, which is which is pretty good um, for for this stage of of machine. Um, but what you can expect as users over the the coming year is that we will be periodically upgrading that device over time, and so that 32 qubit architecture will be uh, progressively improved uh, with higher fidelity uh, qubits and and readout and uh, and uh, 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 on those systems to make it more and more capable over time. Um, also in November, we made that same system available through Amazon Web Services. So AWS launched their, their bracket uh, service into, into a closed beta uh, in November. And that same system, the same Aspen 7 computer, the physical computer, is available through AWS. And so whether you come directly through Rigetti or you're an AWS customer, uh, you get access to exactly the same physical piece of hardware that sits in our, our data center uh, out in Berkeley. Uh, and so one of the things that we're particularly excited about as a company is not only making more powerful computers available, but making those computers available in environments where uh, end users are able to uh, use multiple different software packages together and combine that with uh, other hardware systems. And so as the AWS uh, offering goes to general availability uh, in a few months time, hopefully, uh, the thing that we're looking forward to from uh, all of the end users is how they combine the AWS bracket service in quantum with all of the other tools that AWS have to offer. So things like AWS SageMaker, which is their machine learning environment, similar to TensorFlow, how will people start to make use of, of multiple different high performance systems together uh, to drive uh, even more interesting results out of it. I think that um, what's really been uh, exciting for us over the past six months in particular on this Aspen 7 device is that it's the, the systems are becoming more capable where the trade-off between doing something on a simulator and investigating a, a machine learning um, idea uh, and running it on the quantum system, there's a real time benefit to doing it on the, the quantum system these days. Uh, back on our, on our earlier devices, the 19 qubit system, you know, as a developer, that trade-off wasn't quite as obvious. The, you could still get as much um, understanding uh, out of a simulation system as you could out of, a, uh, out of the hardware in about the same time cost. And so the, the relative value of going to, to the quantum computer itself was, was, was lower until you got to the point where you needed to look at noisy models and, and that kind of thing. But at a 28 qubit device, you know, while we're not yet in that realm of quantum advantage and quantum supremacy from a theoretical um, uh, and experimental threshold, it is practically for the, the, the machine learning developer, it is practically more efficient to run it on the hardware and get results back from that uh, and iterate through the, the, um, the development cycle uh, by using the hardware systems. And so because of that, we're seeing a lot more experimental work on the hardware systems directly for machine learning type problems, uh, like the ones that I just described before. Um, and through that experimental work and pulling empirical results out, that is helping to inform the next steps on 
uh, not only our, our hardware systems, but also the compilers, the, um, the quantum classical interaction that, that comes together on, the, on that. And so just in the past six months, we've had uh, a lot of uh, rich fruit that's been coming off this machine that's helping to inform the next steps uh, that, that we take in, in later devices and, and later accessibility. Uh, so we're, we're really quite uh, pleased with that. And uh, as that 28 qubit and 32 qubit architecture uh, improves over the next uh, couple of years, we expect to see more and more of that and hopefully progressing on our way to, to quantum advantage. Um, and on, in a similar vein, the, one of the questions before was on the, uh, the Google TensorFlow um, system and, and its quantum package and some of the other packages that are, that are starting to come together as well including uh, cross compilers onto different systems. And so we're really excited to be able to see not only how all the Amazon uh, high performance computing uh, pieces come together, but also how other platforms uh, could interact with Frigetti's platforms as well. So taking something that's built inside TensorFlow, cross compiling that to Rigetti and running it within uh, our environment and being able to compare results so that we can get a better collective understanding as a community about uh, the next steps that are needed and the improvements that, that we all need to make uh, to, to reach some kind of commercial quantum advantage here. Um, I, I'll just finish my remarks by talking about um, the, the three improvement vectors that we look along for uh, improving the quantum machine learning uh, application suite. Uh, and these are the things that we can control inside Rigetti or at least influence uh, that help end users in getting uh, better performance uh, out of our systems for machine learning type applications. And it really comes down to three things. One is uh, better encoding of problems onto the circuits themselves. And so this is a, a compiler type problem. How do we take a construct uh, that's been set up for a machine learning type problem and come up with the most efficient way to take that construct and, and uh, implement it on, on our systems in particular? And so the efficiency of that compiler and the amount of control that we can give developers is incredibly important to uh, driving as much efficiency as we can out of there. And uh, we recently released a paper uh, about Quill T, so quantum instruction language, Quill, and then T for time uh, as a, as a time-based uh, compile system uh, that gives a lot more uh, control to the developer over the way that the, uh, the, the, the circuits are implemented uh, on our systems. And so I'll link in the chat uh, a, a link to that paper shortly. So one vector is on the, uh, the compilation structure of machine learning um, uh, constructs down to, down to our systems. The second is uh, improving the error rates uh, and giving tighter control over the, uh, the shots that we make onto each, um, on, on each circuit. And so for most variational algorithms that we run, or all variational algorithms that we run on these computers, you can think of it as having two loops. There's an inner loop, the quantum loop, where we're doing many, many shots uh, on, on the quantum system and pulling some distribution out of that. And then the outer loop is a classical loop where we're comparing that to the objective function and, uh, and resetting the ansatz and, and looping around again. And so we've got uh, two axes there to, to improve on. One is getting more control over that inner loop, uh, reducing the amount of error on there and being able to pull the, the, the right kind of shots out of that that inform the outer loop as, as best we can. Uh, and so a lot of our work recently has been in uh, getting better readout on those inner loops uh, to then inform the, the, the rest of the algorithm. Uh, and then the last vector of control that we're looking at is that outer loop, the entire quantum classical hybrid interaction. So as our quantum chips uh, cycle through their variational algorithm, uh, how are we then reducing the amount of time that it takes to, to loop around and minimizing the number of loops that we need to do uh, through that classical outer loop? And so that in particular has been uh, uh, one of the, the challenges that we've uh, sought to overcome in working with uh, Amazon in particular, they've got their classical systems uh, sitting in Amazon cloud, where Getty's quantum systems are sitting in, on our premises. And so what are the things that we can do to reduce the, the, the number of loops that are required and also the, 
uh, the, the time to go through each one of those. And so uh, I just wanted to give you that taste of, of some of the improvement vectors that we look along as a, as a hardware company that aren't anything at all to do with making better qubits. And, and of course, that's where uh, most of our time is spent making more and better qubits. But there's a lot more to the efficiency and effectiveness of these quantum classical systems uh, from uh, improving their interaction to better compilers, uh, to uh, uh, making them work more effectively with, with other uh, packages and third party compilers out there. And I think that that uh, is a good note to leave on because I know Yanni's going to talk about exactly one of those uh, third party packages uh, that we're excited to work with as well. And uh, I'll hand it over to you. Let me uh, throw one quick question at you, Michael. Going up the stack a little bit uh, using a Rigetti box, do you uh, know of any uh, actual AI or machine learning processes actually running in production on your box or are we still in the theoretical experimental stages? Uh, we're still in experimental stages. I'm not aware of any quantum computing enabled system in production anywhere in the world uh, yet. Maybe there is, but, but I'm certainly not aware of it. And uh, Rigetti's not operating uh, anything like that. Um, but we're not too far away. I think the, the number of generations of computer that are required now to get to that point. Um, now, whether there's a, uh, you know, a, an absolute quantum supremacy type threshold that's crossed in order to reach that, or whether it's just a, um, a, a practical advantage uh, that's reached, reached or a cost advantage or an energy advantage uh, that's reached with these machines. You know, we'll, 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 we'll see how that plays out over time. Um, but the number of generations of hardware that we are away from that moment, I think is, uh, is within reach. To be a little sarcastic here, if I was a reporter out in the media, I'd, I'd ask you for a date that that will occur, but uh, I'll, I'll, I think it's time to go over to Yanni. Yanni? If I knew the date, I would uh, tell you. <laughs> I'm not going to ask. It's against my principles. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks, Michael. Thanks, thanks, Vinay. Uh, this were uh, very, uh, very good um, uh, introductions and um, I will also uh, give a little bit of an introduction into what uh, QCWare does and specifically what we do in uh, quantum machine learning. So um, uh, we like to say, uh, and this quote is not really attributed to, to me, I didn't come up with it, but we'd like to say that um, uh, machine learning is, is at the same time the most overhyped and underestimated field in, uh, in quantum computing. And actually, if you're looking for predictions, I think uh, the optimists maybe say five plus years out. And um, many others are saying we're, we're really, you know, 10 or 15 years away uh, before we can actually use quantum machine learning in, in production, right? Because uh, there is all these things that need to happen on the, uh, the hardware itself and the approaches and, and everything before we can actually use it in production, right? Uh, remember, for, for everyone on the call, just remember that uh, the largest quantum computer now available has 53 quantum bits, right? And these are bits. They're not kilobits or megabits or, or anything like that, right? And we use in classical computations, we use, you know, machines that have um, um, uh, gigabits and, you know, work at uh, gigahertz speeds and all of that, right? So... Uh, so there's a big differential there that that we need to cover, right? Um, but still, I mean, we as a as a software quantum computing company, we concentrate on building new algorithms, right? So we don't um, work on hardware per se. We partner with uh, Michael and our friends at Rigetti to uh, to work on on their hardware, and we concentrate on building new algorithms, right? And we put a lot, actually a lot of uh, thought and we put a lot of resources behind QML because we do think it has tremendous potential, right? Just like classical uh, machine learning, uh, so will uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, so just um, to get a very brief idea of um, how much effort we put into that, uh, you can look at 
our last few publications over the last the two or three years, I think the team has produced something like uh, nine uh, very significant publications. Some of them are considered very um, uh, groundbreaking. Uh, but they're actually a little bit different from um, the techniques that Vinay talked about. So Vinay concentrated on neural nets and for a good reason, right? So neural nets basically was were a revelation. I mean, they brought a revelation basically to the field of uh, classical machine learning. Um, and, uh, you know, they launched all these new products, new, new markets, uh, computer vision, and, you know, speech recognition, natural language processing, you know, all these things, right? Great, great things and um, great achievements. Um, but the thing that we need to understand, if we go just one level deeper, if we just kind of scratch the surface just a little bit uh, more, is that neural nets at their heart are really uh, heuristics, right? So, um, they're not really guaranteed to work. They're not really guaranteed to provide results, right? Um, but they, they end up working really well. Um, again, in the classical world, now that we have figured everything out, they, they end up working really well, right? Uh, but there are many other techniques in classical machine learning, so machine learning in general, where we apply algorithms that are essentially guaranteed, have guaranteed performance or guaranteed to give you uh, a good result or, or the best result in some cases, right? So, and you might have heard some of these names, things like uh, using approaches like uh, k-means or support vector machines for clustering, uh, nearest neighbors for classification, techniques like dimensionality reduction, and, and a few others, right? So those are algorithms as opposed to heuristics. Um, and the algorithms are guaranteed to work and maybe they have different requirements, right? In terms of, you know, um, what kind of hardware you need to run them on and, and so on and so forth, right? And how, how fast they can uh, actually converge. And so you now you might be thinking, well, if the neural nets work so well, um, like you just told us and kind of they launch these new fields, why, why, do we need, why do we even need to worry about the other um, uh, machine learning algorithms? Uh, and the answer is, has um, um, come up recently in conversations that a lot of people have in specifically two industries, uh, healthcare and finance. So people in healthcare and finance don't only care about the final result that you get, don't only care about, you know, whether a certain uh, image has been classified correctly, but they actually care to essentially explain the result they got from uh, the algorithm. And in many cases, it turns out that's actually really hard to do with neural nets, right? So this explainability property is actually really hard with um, neural nets. In the case of some algorithms, actually, it turns out it's, it's simpler, right? And again, when we look at these two specific industries, healthcare and finance, uh, people really care about that for different reasons, right? So if you're going to uh, recommend that a certain pa patient follows a certain you know procedure or approach uh, you need to you need, you need to know why right or in finance if you're uh, having to answer to an auditor or or for regulation purposes again you need to um, say basically you know why you did this and you know why you made the decision um, or you took the decision you took so that's why uh, these other techniques exist and they're still uh, very relevant and um, they're still interesting. Uh, so uh, just to give you an idea of one of these techniques and how uh, we took it from the classical uh, world into the quantum world. So one of the papers that are, are lead in um, quantum machine learning, uh, uh, his name is Jordanis Karanivis. Uh, he wrote this paper on recommendation systems. I think it was something like uh, two or three years ago. Uh, and recommendation systems basically are all the systems that um, uh, retailers, online retailers, and digital streaming services, Amazon, Netflix, all these guys are using basically to recommend the next product that you should uh, consume from them, right? So if you've watched the movie on Netflix, then obviously you get all these other recommendations that say, okay, well, we believe you're going to like this other movie or Amazon, you know, you bought this product and, you know, people like you buy these other products and so on and so forth, right? Um, and it turns out, you know, with classical machine learning, uh, it can take uh, literally, you know, um, um, millions and billions of, of computations of steps to actually calculate this. 
And, but if you do it on a quantum computer, and if you follow some um, the, the QML algorithm that your advantage proposed, you can do that in thousands of steps as opposed to, to um, many, many billions of steps in the classical case. So the difference in scale is pretty dramatic and the difference in speed is, can be pretty dramatic. And that's why QML is you know, very, uh, very interesting so that um, we can actually do all these things so much faster. Um, and there are a few others, right, in that same, that follow the same approach, right? So there's the uh, new um, quantum version of k-means, and we've called it q-means, so it's not, you know, it's very, pretty simple, not, not very inspiring in terms of a name choice. Um, but um, the thing to say about these approaches, it turns out that they also have very, very significant requirements when it comes to hardware, right? And so they require hardware that um, uh, has a lot of qubits and hardware that has few errors, right? And um, also they actually require some hardware that you know, we haven't even introduced yet, hasn't even introduced, been introduced commercially uh, to load the classical data into the quantum computer in an efficient uh, fashion. And they call that QRAM. And so if you've seen any um, literature around uh, quantum machine learning, you're going to immediately see kind of things like, okay, well, this requires QRAM or this requires a fault tolerant uh, computer. So you might be asking us then, okay, well, why does QCWare kind of go that, down this path, which is maybe, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years away and um, uh, uh, kind of follows that approach instead of following the approach of kind of the neural nets. Yes, you told us about this explainability thing, and then you know some of the key industries are really interested in that, but th that seems to be right, really far out. And the answer to that is that we are essentially coming at the entire problem from the opposite approach than hardware vendors, right? So hardware vendors, basically, as Michael just said, where their main priority is to build bigger um, computers, so more qubits, and better qubits, less noisy qubits. So we come at it from the other uh, side, which is basically to build algorithms that require less qubits and uh, require more noisy qubits potentially, or can work in the presence of more noisy qubits. So we kind of put our stake in the ground with these approaches that are maybe 10 or 15 years away, and now we're working slowly to actually um, minimize the hardware requirements that um, are, are needed to actually run those approaches, right? So that's, that's our approach, and, um, and I guess that's what's different about what, what we do at QCWare and, um, and QML specifically, right? And we actually do two things um, in, in closing. We, um, we work with a lot of large enterprises that are interested in working in QML and understanding QML. Uh, people understand that even though it's uh, maybe you know five or ten or fifteen years away, um, just like when machine learning and AI came around five or six years ago, uh, the biggest constraint on companies was um, uh, human resources, right? So uh, people with data science backgrounds with the right skills to actually put these uh, techniques into good use. Uh, so the same is going to happen with uh, quantum machine learning, right? In order to apply QML uh, to your business processes and take advantage basically of all the uh, great things it will offer, uh, you would need the right skills. So people essentially are beginning to realize these large enterprises that are launching uh, dedicated quantum computing initiatives like big banks or oil and gas companies, energy companies, um, automotive, aerospace, all these guys are essentially are launching their own initiatives right now because the key thing is actually building skills internally and understanding how you're going to use these approaches when essentially the machines and the algorithms um, get there. So one of the key things that we do at QCWare uh, is to help through professional services engagements, these enterprises to understand the techniques, to educate them, uh, to augment their research teams by essentially doing research together and doing uh, publications and explorations of specific uh, problems. So that's one of the key things we do as a company. And the other thing we do is um, put some of these techniques that we've published, um, put some of these techniques into our software uh, product, uh, which is um, a cloud service. So you can think of it as you know, quantum computing uh, as a service. Um, 
which is a, essentially a service that would sit on top of AWS Bracket, right? So uh, it's very analogous to what is happening in the classical world where you have basically application providers sitting on top of AWS. So in the same, the same is pretty much true for the quantum world where you know, we as, a, as an application provider uh, are building an application that sits on top of AWS Bracket and through AWS Bracket, our application can access uh, Rigetti and other backends that, um, that they provide. Uh, so, uh, so that's essentially the second kind of main uh, effort or main dimension in which we operate. We do the implementations and they're turnkey implementations so that um, people with limited experience in quantum computing can come to our uh, service and essentially try out the algorithms and see how they need to change their input and what kind of results they're going to get from, from the algorithms. And we have some of these QML techniques that I talked about, so classification and, and clustering, uh, we have them already available and, um, um, and you can already basically try them. And I guess since it was mentioned uh, early on, um, um, the third thing that we do as a company is organize Q2B. Uh, as Terrell said, uh, we hope um, we're going to have another successful Q2B later this year. Uh, we're making some final decisions and we're going to make some announcements um, very soon now and exactly how it's going to be hosted and um, uh, all the details around it and what um, uh, the content is going to look like and how we're going to deliver it. So stay tuned for that. And with that, I'm going to um, open it up back to the audience and to you, Terrell. Thanks, Yanni. Uh, let me uh, toss out a first question that, that comes from me, and we've got a, quite a few questions uh, in the chat and Q&A uh, that are a little more technical in nature than, than this question, but let's see if I can spark some fireworks in discussion amongst the three of you. Um, you know, as I see it, the, um, the classical computing stack evolved over decades uh, starting back in the 40s-ish, and it was really a sequential process where, you know, the hardware folks uh, figured out how to get vacuum tubes to hold data and, and so on, and, and then finally we discovered that we need uh, machine language and assemblers and then up to compilers and fourth generation languages, et cetera. So it was, overall, the ecosystem was kind of a, a sequential process, figured out the next step once we got there. And uh, as you all know, uh, with quantum, uh, the ecosystem is kind of uh, developing almost all uh, aspects of that stack from algorithms and applications down to, you know, the most basic parts of hardware in parallel. And, uh, and that includes even workforce development where, as uh, Yanni mentioned, we're looking to develop uh, you know, people that can work on quantum computers uh, in large corporations now, even though we really don't have a really large functional production quantum computer necessarily right now. So uh, what do you guys think about that? How is this, this parallel development where, you know, we're, we're creating software for machines that don't and may not even ever exist? How's that working out for you guys? <laughs> and, 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 you know, what, what might you change about this phenomena uh, in the development of this ecosystem going forward, if, if anything? Yeah, well, I, I think it's, it's, it is a phenomena when we look back at the history of computing overall. But I think for quantum computing, you know, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants in the, in the computing world. Um, much of what we build at Rigetti is building on systems and processes that were developed for CPUs and GPUs. Uh, we, we have our own fab. Uh, in that fab, we make our own chips. And into that fab go silicon wafers uh, that use a uh, lithography process that produces a, uh, a QPU that comes out the other end. And we assemble that QPU. Uh, into our, our systems and we put them in the fridge and cool them down and make them available through the cloud with a uh, classical computing uh, backend. Um, 
Rigetti would not be able to produce what it does today without the um, you know, 70 years and, a, and trillions of dollars of investment that has gone into, into the QPU industry. And similarly, we are informed by the roadmap that computers have been on together. And we know that to be successful, computers need hardware, software, firmware, ecosystem, workforce development, educational links, all of those ingredients in order to make it successful. And I think that rather than do that sequentially, we can learn all of those lessons from the, the past 70 years or so and, and hopefully accelerate uh, uh, the, the adoption of, of this new technology in much the same way that the adoption of GPUs over the past 10 years has been accelerated by the lessons that were learned uh, through uh, generations before that. Yeah, and I was just going to add to that, that we also, um, I mean, we at QCWare believe that we're going to get a production um, application in this NISC era, what we call the NISC era, so the, the noisy intermediate scale era. So we don't really, we, we don't have, we won't have to wait for fully fault tolerant um, large scale uh, quantum computers before we can deliver some value. And I think actually the, the quantum supremacy uh, experiment, you know, is good proof of that. I mean, it was, I think, a major milestone for, uh, uh, for the entire industry. The fact that, you know, you had a quantum computer basically deliver on a task that uh, a classical computer could, uh, you know, it, it would take days or years. I mean, depending on who you want to, who you want to believe, I guess, but um, everybody agreed that, you know, um, the quantum computer was basically much faster at this at this task. And yes, I know it was a contrived problem. It wasn't a practical problem, but you know, you gotta pass through that milestone before you get to, to a re real problem. So um, I think the time scale, if you look back, the time scale for for getting to uh, to practical value is, is shrinking all the time, right? So uh, 20 years ago, if you had asked people, you know, what they think of quantum computing, they would have just laughed. I mean, you know, it wasn't it wasn't even a uh, someone, something that business people would, would even consider was something that, you know, just, just technical people would just, you know, discuss, um, you know, quietly maybe. Uh, and now here, here we are today. So, so the time frame is constantly shrinking. Yeah. And just to add something on this. Uh, so the thing is, uh, right now, as Terrell mentioned, I guess there is one more aspect which is involved in developing any new compute environment, and that is accessibility. And in the case of quantum computers, there is a lot of research that is uh, going on and a lot of new architectures that are being set up. But these architectures should also be conveyed to the general public more effectively. And I guess once this starts happening, then uh, quantum computers will really you know start seeing the influx of demand which uh, which is seen by something like classical computers or neural networks or even machine learning models so essentially what i i like to think of it is that quantum computers are something like a geometric mean of science fiction and something that is fairly obvious so it sits somewhere in between and for every person this uh, balance is somewhat different but essentially, the main idea is that in order to you know, have a more mainstreamed acceptance towards uh, quantum computers, the need right now is not having better systems or having uh, more improved architectures because right now uh, we are very much advanced at that aspect. But another very important part is uh, having more interaction towards what is actually being developed right now. What do you mean by that last statement? So, like, just to elaborate it more, essentially, what I mean that uh, what I mean by the statement where I said, uh, right now we don't need more research, but we need more public involvement. So we just need more contribution made by uh, different people. So, mm -hmm. like, we had a question for Michael, which said, "Are there any production level systems on which use uh, quantum hardware?" And the answer is no. So once we start having these sort of uh, production level systems on quantum computers, this is when you know we can have a lot of influx of interest inside this particular cycle. 
Cool. You know, one question that's that uh, is out there uh, quite a bit when it comes to machine learning uh, is the question about QRAM. So, uh, is you know we we can write algorithms or we're learning to write algorithms in a uh, you know a noisy world. Uh, can machine learning actually succeed in general without QRAM? <laughs> Well, it, this is where I'll disagree with Vinay just a little bit. I think his take of uh, we don't need more research uh, is, a, is a spicy take uh, because uh, in our view, we need a heck of a lot more research and in particular on things like QRAM and uh, quantum error correction. Um, and this is where, you know, things like the, the National Quantum Initiative and the funding that's going into, um, uh, into the, the, the national university systems and the, the national labs, is going to be so critical to helping uh, us tackle some of those problems because you know we don't know whether we will be able to get to production level machine learning without some form of QRAM. Uh, we hope that we will. Uh, it will be you know tremendous if we're able to pull that off and are able to uh, deliver commercial value um, uh, without that technology. But it, it'll be a heck of a lot easier if QRAM is a is a viable uh, implementation on the kind of systems that we that we build. So we need that kind of um, basic and applied research to continue, um, and uh, we hope that it happens uh, sooner rather than later. And I'm going to add to that. I, I completely agree with Michael. And um, and for the audience, I'm going to say that hey, look, uh, it's not uh, that RAM existed from. Uh, you know, early on in computing, right? I mean, we kind of caught on to the fact that we need RAM later on, and then someone, uh, you know, uh, uh, saw the need for it and designed it, and basically, um, uh, you know, put that put that into the uh, into the computing models we have today, right? So it's the same thing with QRAM. Right now, um, it doesn't seem like a top priority for the hard hardware vendors, uh, but um, I think it's actually it's going to come around sooner than uh, um, than uh, anyone anyone thinks. We're actually uh, again we from from the QCWare perspective. I mean that's one of the fundamental things we're working on, essentially making QML more accessible. And QRAM is sort of like one of the key things that 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 we're working on. Not ready to make any announcements just yet on anything, but um, uh, I guess stay tuned. You want to put a date on that? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, we've in the meetup community, uh, we've had a, a, a number of uh, machine learning QML uh, presentations over the past few weeks, and they're all highly attended. Uh, but have we really found a Shor's algorithm of sorts uh, for QML? That is. Uh, a, an algorithm or a technique that uh, we believe will have definite, assuming we get the hardware and, and the rest of the stack, that will have definite advantages over the classical machine learning? Uh, so when it comes to, if you're comparing, yeah, so, so the answer, the short answer is yes, right? And again, you know, I'm not, uh, you should, I'll, I'll put a link, I already put a link to your Adonis' paper on recommendation systems, but, um, uh, you know, again, if you look at his link on uh, his paper on, for example, Q-means, right, um, there's a theoretical speed up there, right? So assuming, again, we, assuming you have QRAM or assuming you have a machine that's, that's big enough, the approach is then guaranteed to give you a speed up over, over classical, just because it doesn't scale, um, um, as poorly as classical uh, machine learning scales with the size of the data set, right? So the, the scaling happens on different dimensions of the pro problem or, or, uh, or it's not linear with the dimension of the data set, right? So it doesn't scale with M and N. It's, um, it scales much smoothly in those dimensions. So, so the speed up is there if we can uh, if we can find the machine or, and if we can, you know, uh, assume that we can get to QRAM and, you know, um, um, yeah, build that in essentially into the entire system. Yeah, just, yeah, I'm just oh, you got Jimmy. 
Yeah, go ahead. Sure. So just to add to that, I, you know, as we look back at the the history of machine learning, classical machine learning, um, the theoretical mathematical underpinnings for that technology came after the empirical experimental work as well. So that the constructs were there. And as more compute power became available and it became practical to start to explore um, classical machine learning from an imperial, empirical basis and deliver value there, then the mathematics started to uh, catch up to it. And uh, I expect that something similar will happen uh, with uh, quantum machine learning, that we don't have kind of the Shor's algorithm uh, uh, theoretical breakthrough for uh, quantum machine learning. But what we do have now, particularly over the last uh, 12 months or so, are machines that are more and more capable that allow developers to do that, that empirical work and explore that space, not necessarily needing uh, the, the proofs underpinning it yet, but, but that can then, that empirical work can help inform the theoretical work uh, rather than the other way around in a similar way that it happened with, uh, uh, with the, the, the classical approach to, to machine learning. Um, so, you know, I'll anticipate there'll be a, um, a arms race between classical and, and quantum machine learning. You know, in many of the quantum algorithms uh, that have been proposed over the last couple of years, uh, the classical approaches, a, a dequantizing uh, type approach can be taken and, and move that back across to the classical land where it's more efficient there. Um, but that's what is enabled by having hardware that we can go test with and, and play around with. Cool. And just to add something here, yeah, like I completely agree with uh, what Michael said right now, uh, which is that uh, definitely this landscape is very interesting as of now. And also what I think, uh, Terrell, is that uh, we have found Shor's algorithm for problem specific approaches. So if you just boil down the entire quantum machine uh, learning domain and if you just split it into a lot of different sub problems which can be you know, executed on a quantum environment, then I guess we are doing pretty well on those domains where we can solve a problem specifically on a quantum computer. But when you look at it from an entire domain's perspective, then I guess uh, the answer is we still need to find that algorithm. Okay, here's another one. This one's uh, from Chuck and uh, uh, he's a student in, uh, in a Udacity course. Let me read it. Uh, I've been looking at published articles about convolutional neural networks. I am putting myself through AI training at Udacity. Is there a cloud quantum computer available or soon to be available that is capable to doing something like a uh, quantum neural network net or for the MN or MNIST training set. Uh, the published articles were about something very similar, but I doubt those researches were done on publicly available cloud services. Uh, Chuck, I've got some good news for you. Uh, one of the primary authors of the, the Q&N uh, work that you might be looking at on that and this work is a fellow named Max Henderson. He's a colleague of ours at Rigetti uh, and he's on the call uh, right now um, so we can connect you. Um, but I'll also link in the chat a recent paper that Max uh, just put on the archive with the experimental work of a Q&N uh, for a um, uh, satellite imagery uh, data set that, that we've been using. So yes, and, and this the short answer to your question is yes, we've just started doing this at Rigetti over the past uh, couple of months is running these QNNs on operational hardware and uh, we're starting to publish the first results of that now. Very cool. I might add uh, Max has given, uh, Max Henderson has given a couple of meetup presentation. So if you look at the history uh, of the Washington quantum computing meetup folks, as well as the uh, Philadelphia Harrisburg quantum meetup, um, the, his presentation, I believe, are, are, is available on both in recorded form. Uh, hey, Max, by the way. Uh, what are, here's another question. Uh, what are the sort of use cases that are currently considered to be potentially be running on in a production stage in the healthcare finance fields? 
So, so let's be very clear, right? There's nothing that you can do now on a quantum computer that's production grade. Uh, there's just absolutely nothing. Quantum computers are so small, you just can't have a production level system kind of working on a quantum computer. You have more uh, power, computing power on your laptop or even your phone, right? So, um, uh, so we're still, you know, uh, at least a couple of years or maybe a few years away from the first production level applications, right? Assuming hardware gets developed uh, and we have breakthroughs in, in algorithms and so on and so forth. Yeah, there's been a lot of activity in fin finance, obviously. Do you guys know anything about uh, uh, applications being developed for he healthcare? It's obviously a current so topic. Healthcare, yeah, yeah. So there's uh, there's definitely a lot of activity in finance around derivative pricing and portfolio optimization. So the research um, uh, concentrate, is concentrated around those two use cases. Uh, a third use case is around um, uh, in finance around uh, things like fraud detection. Um, and in healthcare, uh, the key use cases are around uh, image classification, especially of MRI scans and um, um, or, or recommendations of, um, of treatments based on uh, a host of different dimensions, right? So tests, lab tests, and, you know, um, clinical um, observations and, and things of that sort, right? Uh, so that those are those are the interesting cases, the most interesting or the most um, um, popular cases in healthcare right now. Uh, I'll, I'll add one more to that. There was uh, some work published in September last year, which was on a, uh, a machine learning approach to a, um, a, a human cancer uh, data set. Um, that. Uh, that work came out of the, the Harvard Medical School um, in collaboration with uh, the University of Southern California. Now they ran it on, on D-Wave devices, but the particular method that they used is also well, very well suited to uh, the, the gate model devices like, like what we build. Um, and so th that's a, a, a really great example of the machine learning uh, applications to the healthcare uh, world, looking through a very, very high dimensional data set um, and looking at clustering within a um, the, the cancer genome atlas. So I'll, I'll throw the link into the chat there as well for that paper. Thanks. Uh, back to you, Michael, uh, about that QRAM que question. Uh, is Rigetti working on quantum or quantum hybrid systems like introducing diamond NV centers as quantum memory? I think that's nitrogen vacancy centers? Uh, the short, short answer to that is no. Uh, we're very focused on the, the superconducting work uh, that, that we're doing right now. Um, and we've got a, a pretty ambitious roadmap for the next couple of years at least, just improving our superconducting circuits uh, and making those the, the best that, that we can. Um, but that's not to rule out doing mixed quantum environments in the future. I think that that's certainly one of the areas that's uh, uh, got a lot of potential um, and being able to so uh, at Rigetti if you if you get the chance to, to visit our data center uh, sometime in the future once we're allowed back out out of the house again uh, at, at our data center you'll see we've got lots of dilution refrigerators um, uh, settled next to each other so there's there's a big warehouse lots of dilution refrigerators in each of those refrigerators is one circuit there's one QPU that sits in there uh, one of the things that we would like to do in the future is to connect multiple circuits in different fridges together through some link. And so that would require some kind of quantum connection going between different fridges uh, and, and connecting uh, multiple circuits together and um, therefore expanding the amount of work, uh, amount of uh, uh, capacity on those chips that, that we've got to work with uh, to, to solve circuits that would require having a quantum link uh, going between those fridges. And so having quantum to quantum you know, connections uh, using some kind of uh, quantum communication structure within our own data center, that's, that's something that we're, we're very interested in uh, long-term as well. But you know, in the short term, we've got a lot of work to do just making our superconducting qubits the, the best they can be. 
Thanks. Uh, staying with QRAM for a second, uh, <clears throat> there's a question, is, is QRAM more of a hardware problem or a software problem? Uh, so it can be either. So you can develop a software that loads classical data efficiently. Um, of course, if you, uh, if you design the hardware for it, if you design specific hardware that does this specific task, then you can be much more efficient uh, at it. And you can then kind of save your computational qubits for other tasks, right? For your real computation. Uh, so if you do it in software, then effectively you're kind of, um, you'll be um, limiting yourself. You'll be using essentially part of the hardware for this efficient data loading and then the other part for running the algorithm, right? Um, if you had it separately, if you had like a separate chip or like another part of the chip that does that uh, more efficiently, then, then you can use your entire quantum chip for the algorithm itself. So it can be done in both. Uh, right now, there isn't really an implementation either in hardware or software that I'm aware of. So, um, but it can be done in both. Cool, thanks. Okay, no more QRAM questions. All right, guys, <laughs> I, I promise you. Uh, this goes back to, uh, to Vinay, way back to his uh, talk. Uh, and I hope I'm allowed to say this, this word with this audience. But uh, Vinay, how does your, your, um, uh, your system uh, work differently from Penny Lane, from that of Penny Lane? Yeah, sure. So uh, in Penny Lane, uh, like I've worked on even the architecture of building some Penny Lane systems. So the main difference in the system which I'm currently working on and uh, Penny Lane, uh, a penny lane system is that uh, again uh, we use a pre-trained neural network in order to map something on the quantum space so if you have a neural network then mapping each and every neuron in the 3d data space and then converting it down to a simpler uh, sample which has uh, less number of dimensions and then mapping it on a quantum computer so this first step is done by a neural network. So this is what, uh, this is something which uh, I personally believe in that uh, having a non-static binding uh, from a neuron or from a neural network layer onto a three-dimensional data space is very important because as and when we start solving more problems, then this binding is uh, gonna be a lot stronger but also a lot different in a lot of problems so if you want that one solution for or one underlying architecture for solving uh, machine learning neural network related problems then you need to have a non-static approach so this is the main difference where we use a pre-trained neural network okay staying with you Vinay for a second this is the very first question I think tonight that I just haven't gotten to and I just got reminded about it uh, if calculating partial derivatives were free would we make them more complex to get better accuracy or faster convergence how big of an obstacle is that yeah so there are two answers to this so in in the short uh, short term, if you look at it, then if calculating partial derivatives was free, then essentially we have a huge quantum leap in terms of uh, the performance which can be extracted out of existing computing devices. So definitely for some period of time, the training processes on any machine learning algorithm would be a lot faster. But again, the thing is that you are always limited by the slowest link in the chain. So essentially, there are also other pipelines like data influx, then calculating the loss values, and uh, etc. So essentially, if you have the if you have partial derivatives as free computation, which is highly unlikely, then you are still limited by your data inflow pipelines your loss, uh, loss calculation pipeline. So essentially the answer to this is yes. If at this instant calculating partial derivatives was free, then we would be able to create much more complex systems with, much, with a huge number of neurons because ultimately 
like even if you add one single layer in a neuron then the number of uh, derivative calculations grow up exponentially so if this calculation was free then we would be creating a lot more complex neural architectures and that would further open doors to actually analyze if certain sort of problems could be solved by using a classical uh, neural architecture which is much more advanced than what we are seeing right now thank you now here's a this is a different one uh, the privacy policy on public quantum computer use grants the quantum company all rights to algorithms and data used on the system if that's accurate uh, any insights on this topic and on protecting IP? I think that's specific to IBM's uh, policy on accessing their systems for the free tier that they use. Um, certainly, Rigetti offers a, a different uh, um, uh, policy, and, and I think our partners at AWS will also offer something different as part of their general availability. So I think. Uh, you know, uh, IBM's offering some good stuff, but there's some there's some uh, hooks to it. Uh, shop around, you might be able to find a, a better deal. That's interesting. I was not aware of that. Thanks for asking the question and answering it. Is is IBM just a one-off here, or do you know of other companies that have that? Uh, uh, well, there's only two publicly available quantum cloud systems today and that's um, IBM's and Rigetti's that go direct to uh, users um, and once AWS goes to general availability that will open up uh, a few others um, and if you're lucky enough to get access to, to Google's or to, to other systems then, then those are under a, a, a bilateral agreement with them rather than a, an open policy. And to be fair, I think that applies, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that applies, that statement applies to the open tier systems right. from IBM, right? So the ones that are basically available for free, right? Yeah, so this right. Is IBM free, is free tier. Once, once you start paying some money, you can get a, a, a different, uh, different policy from IBM. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how much time, gentlemen, how much time should we wait to leverage the speed of NISC of speed up of NISC algorithms for data science slash big data problems. How much time should we wait to leverage the speed up? Uh, so, so basically, uh, it's asking for a date, right? Just, just like <laughs> I didn't ask it. <laughs> yeah, but but it's a it's a common question, right? I mean, we yeah. get this question now uh, all the time um, nowadays, and and so really, um, I'm not going to make a prediction, but but here's the thing, I think we're going to have much better success with problems where the complexity doesn't come from the data size um, or the size of the data, right? So we're not going to have success with problems where the problem is hard because you have to process, let's say, a million data points. Uh, I think where NIST computers are going to have success is with problems where the complexity comes from uh, the structure of the problem uh, even in small data sets, right? Even with, let's say, you know, 200 points or 500 uh, data points. And, um, and the problem is still very hard for um, classical computers. And uh, people typically point to two types of problems that have this characteristic. So one is problems in chemistry simulation, computational problems in chemistry. And the other uh, is NP-hard problems in binary optimization, right? So there, are, you can definitely construct a pretty hard problem with, let's say, a thousand variables in binary optimization, and um, classical techniques might have a hard time solving that, right? Not that we know for a fact that quantum computers can actually solve uh, those, but th that's where basically uh, I think the hopes for for NISC making an impact in practical applications, that's where the hopes are, are resting that we will uh, find some of those problems and we'll be able to solve some of those problems. Tactical request here. Uh, Michael, what was the uh, reference to uh, the, was it Harvard uh, MQL case study? 
Yeah, so or Harward. Uh, I've thrown that into the chat already. Okay. Um, okay. Something like that. Cool. Uh, as of now, do any of you think that a particular qubit methodology that, that is working better uh, for QML algorithms? Is there a, a modality out there that's specifically suited well for QML? It's tough to say. Um, you know, the, the temptation, of course, is representing a hardware company is to say that our hardware is the best for everything, but of course that's... <laughs> You know, um, I'm, I'm not going to go down that path, uh, it, but it's and it, it's tough to generalize for all the different kinds of quantum machine learning that can be done as well. So whether it's on superconducting or ion track or um, or photonic, um, you know, I think the work that Xanadu are doing with their photonic devices that are you know really using them as a, a, a dedicated sampling device and, and not um, uh, uh, not using the same kind of uh, gate model construct that that we do at Rigetti with the, the universal uh, gate model, but instead they've kind of specialized their photonic device to be a sampling engine uh, itself. And and if you look at the Xanadu uh, presentations about how their hardware roadmap plays out, there's a, a convergence um, coming into the universal gate model uh, approach from from that direction as a sampler. And I think that that's a, a really interesting pathway as well. That's it's quite complementary uh, to the type of uh, platforms that we're building. Um, and so I think it will come down to the specific use case, the specific algorithm in machine learning and, and how that machine in particular uh, uh, is able to, to support that. And that includes everything from the way the qubits are architected to the comp compilation down to that and uh, and the readouts and the quantum uh, quantum classical hybrid architecture that, that lives through there. Um, so I think I've avoided the trap of saying that superconducting is clearly the best for everything. And uh, <laughs> well, you know, I think it'll be uh, very dependent on the use case. Okay. Uh Guys, there is a new hybrid HHL algorithm. How can it be compared to the VQLS algorithm? Which one would be better for data science tasks? I'll have to defer on that. I'm not, okay. uh, I don't think I'm in a position to answer that. Yeah. Um, Charlie, I will uh, connect you with some folks who can help dig into that one as well. That would be cool. Please, Thanks. yeah, please reach out. I don't know if we have, uh, if the attendees have our uh, email addresses, then if you reach out, we'll we'll help you out. If you want to, you can type it in the chat. Okay, yeah. That'd be cool. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. I disagree. Uh, one question coming in is, I disagree with the statement that mathematics caught up after empirical results of the computation, computational field. If anything, the math aspect was ready and waiting for a long time. It, wa it was used under different forms, one of them probably the most representative being signal processing. <laughs> yeah, I, uh... <laughs> you see that one? I was maybe a little uh, inelegant and, and hand wavy with my statement before. I think some machine learning approaches, you know, uh, the empirical work led the theoretical, of course. Uh, there, was, there was a really strong basis, particularly for things like Boltzmann machines, uh, well before the, the hardware caught up. Um, you know, the, I, I think this illustrates the need for the combination of that, that uh, theoretical and empirical work working together uh, to, to solve that. But yeah, you got me. Heads up, guys. You got 82 people following every word you're saying, so be careful. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the questions are pretty much uh, dried up here. Uh, any, uh, I think it's good to start to wrap up. Any closing comments or anything to, that any of you want to add? or ask each other in an open forum like this? Guys?
Danny, can we get a discount on our QDB sponsorship with uh, coronavirus? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll um, we'll see. I mean, we're we're really working hard to actually figure what we'll do this year. Uh, we still think that uh, December, even though it's uh, far away, uh, having uh, uh, a 700 person event, uh, that's what we would be aiming for for this year for on-site participation. It's probably still not going to be allowed in the state of California. Um, and also, uh, we expect that, you know, the big tech companies, I mean, big tech companies that are uh, really following the space and will send a lot of people and will send speakers like Google and IBM and Microsoft and, and you guys, right? I mean, you probably have the stay at home um, and work from home policies that extend, uh, maybe not all the way to December, but uh, probably it's not going to be considered critical travel, right? It's not, uh, I, I would imagine big tech companies and small tech companies will not uh, take the risk of being liable for, for someone, you know, for sending someone to, to a business event where they're liable to, to, to get sick. Right. So, um, and it doesn't probably, yeah, uh, you have to be a little bit conservative, right. When, when it comes to that and, and take care of, of uh, your employees and, um, but I think we can manage to put together uh, still a very compelling event. So uh, it's probably going to be uh, virtual and uh, we'll deliver a lot of content, a lot of good content virtually. And if by some chance, you know, things are clear and, you know, we, it's, uh, it's safe to, to have 700 people together in the same room, we'll add the on-site component at the last second. So that's how we're probably going to, to set things up. So it's a, a, a virtual or a digital first event, and then the on-site component gets added uh, if, if we can uh, add that component. Wow, you started the conversation out in a superposition state and you kind of gra gra gravitated over into something a little more definite, thanks. Sure. Uh, well, I hope you do have it. I, I attended last year and I'd recommend uh, anybody going. Uh, it was, it's a really good event. Uh, not only is there good content, but it gives you a great opportunity to talk face to face with folks. So uh, I encourage people to. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely be there. And just yeah. to leave, leave folks with a, a thing to look out for, um, the Amazon bracket general availability uh, coming soon. Um, I don't know the exact exact date yet, um, but it's, it's uh, not too far away. Um, that'll be quite exciting, I think. Um, you know, being able to have open access to all of the tools that Amazon make available, not just the quantum computing stuff, but all of their compute, being able to combine that together and access not just Rigetti machines, but other uh, hardware as well. I think that'll be uh, a pretty exciting moment. So keep an eye out for that soon. Unofficially, and I, I sort of doubt you're in that level of a conversation, but you think it'll be affordable to, uh, you know, the, the growing uh, ecosystem out here that's not corporate supported? Uh, you yeah, there will, be, there will be some costs to it, um, but I think you know, particularly if you're with a business or a research institution, um, AWS has a, I think it's called AWS Academics or something, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a whole program of, of providing compute access to the academic world that, that plugs into the bigger AWS. And then one of the other things that AWS provides to businesses is um, access to its cloud compute infrastructure, generally at, at discounted rates. And one of the things you might be able to do if you're a, if you're a business looking at this is maybe sp spend a little on the quantum compute, but you know, don't, don't hear from me, but um, Amazon might be able to do your deal on other forms of compute uh, that make it affordable. Do you know off chance uh, whether uh, uh, there's they're planning simulators? Uh, yes, there are simulators available within oh, cool. the previous bracket. Yeah. Sweet. I uh, got a couple more questions. You guys got time for just a couple simple ones? You okay? Yeah. All right. Vinay, I think the sun's coming up there soon, so you, you, you might be all right. Um, any comments on topological quantum computing's future? Uh, I don't have any particular insight into how the team at Microsoft is going on on that system. Uh, they, uh, 
whenever I catch up with them, they sound very positive and say, uh, keep an eye out for them. We'll keep waiting. Uh, yes. I don't have any insights either, but uh, I mean, you know, if it happens, it will be exciting. And so we're all the best luck. Yeah. Okay. Got to thank you very much, everybody. A uh, couple thank yous. Uh, last one. Let's close with this one. All right. Regarding COVID-19, uh, how do you guys see this affecting current and future research into quantum computing? And we'll end on that. Uh, oh. You know, as a hardware company, we have staff that need to interact with hardware and we need to produce chips. And so having stay at home orders um, is it makes that challenging to get people into the lab and, and doing work. We've um, done a good job so far at being able to uh, accommodate that and work around it and comply with all the rules. Um, but the longer it goes on, the, the challenges will continue to mount. Um, but from a software team and uh, the, the systems team perspective, we've been operating very smoothly. Um, our uh, hardware has had um, the same uptime that we would expect uh, if we were on site. So we've been very happy with the robustness of our systems to, to make that available, even if we're not in the room. Yeah, yeah I mean, just do it like software side, so it's actually easier. And uh, but the one comment I was going to make was on um, demand and interactions with uh, customers and you know large enterprises and their research teams. And um, obviously, the the ones that are that were in flight are still going on virtually. But um, you know, people have scaled back uh, budgets, right? I mean, you know, some of the biggest uh, industries that were involved in this and were supporting quantum computing have been hit hard. So uh, they're scaling back some some of their programs. Um, the good thing is that we have government programs as well. So, um, so those can, um, you know, uh, can help to kind of fill in the gap. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a little bit of a slowdown, especially in industries like aerospace, oil and gas, right? And, um, um, yeah, primarily, primarily those two. And they have just to like add something here. Uh, like, do we have time for that? Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you how how is it affecting your productivity? Yeah, sure. So, uh, like regarding working from home, I guess that's a pretty good thing. But the, also, like something which I would like to add on, like the general interest in the quantum space, uh, which is that. I've seen a lot of uh, like new uh, interest and new talent coming into this domain. And, you know, there are different questions like how can we do drug discovery on quantum computers and various research and like all the different research going uh, behind that domain. So with COVID-19 actually, uh, like I know that uh, actually simulating drugs on a quantum computer is uh, like we are very far from actually doing that. But still, uh, like due to this entire uh, pandemic, uh, we have a lot of uh, interest in the quantum computing domain and a lot of uh, people have started knowing the future applications of quantum computing, which is very interesting according to me. And also I have a very short question for Michael if we have time for that. Fire away. Yeah, so the thing is, uh, like basically, uh, you define the way in which uh, the quantum computing landscape grows. And by you, uh, essentially, I mean the hardware companies. So how do you decide what comes next? Like, how do you decide to weigh in all these factors? Like, do we build uh, systems with more qubits or do we build system with uh, less noisy qubits or do we focus on like peripheral developments like QRAM and stuff. Like what do you, how do you decide what comes next? Uh, yeah, there's, there's no easy answer to that question. It's a, you know, a constant challenge of resource allocation and, and priority uh, inside the company. Um, I won't get deep into how we think about that, but suffice to say it's a, it's a very practical uh, decision-making um, uh, approach where what we're looking to do is advance the science and art uh, as fast as we can. And so getting better chips out into users' hands is the thing that, that guides that. So whatever we're able to produce at lowest risk and, and um, 
uh, the shortest time frame to get to users is is tends to be where the company will go. Uh, but then there's external factors. One thing we didn't talk about tonight is the the new DARPA program that Rigetti is is working on. Uh, we partnered with NASA and USRA. Um, it's a eight million dollar DARPA grant to focus on uh, one particular algorithm in, in QAOA uh, and to improve our systems, so chip, software, compilers, everything, to make that algorithm perform faster and faster. So we'll be, we'll be making choices in our hardware development that are informed by the requirements that have been set for us by DARPA. So responding to, to customers like that as well. Yeah, thanks for that. Staying with the machine learning theme, it's probably a hell of a decision tree with a couple of really complicated feedback loops tossed in there for sport. Um, but uh, um, let me add one thing on the COVID thing. I mean, one thing that we as a community should experience, I would think, is uh, uh, certainly uh, an increase in funding, not only in the United States for quantum research, you know, not not only you know we were doing we were increasing funding around the world in India and UK and United States and China are going at it, uh, but I think COVID nineteen is is definitely going to um, speed up uh, and increase that investment uh, because uh, we certainly can't solve COVID nineteen problems using current computing capabilities. Uh, so I would think. And you guys probably would agree. Uh, we we can expect some more government funding uh, coming out of this problem. All right. Anyway, thanks, guys. Uh, on behalf of, I think we were up to around 88, 89 people. I think you beat Max's record, guys. Uh, Max Henderson's record the other day. He was up in the 80s and 90s as well. But thank you all for your time uh, and energy, the three of you, and uh, for everybody dialing in or clicking in tonight. Thanks for coming by. I've got a couple things to, uh, I've got these uh, slides to show you once again, I think. Um, as we end here, going back to the slides I showed you at the beginning, thanks a lot to the Association, Association Quantum guys. Uh, their URL is shown there. I think you can see that on the screen share. Uh, one question was about the upcoming events. Uh, the event tomorrow, tomorrow at noon, at 11.30, that's, uh, the information on that is available at the associationquantum.org website or the Association Quantum um, uh, Meetup Group. The uh, event on May 16th is information on that is available at the uh, Washington Quantum Computing Meetup Group, and uh, as as well as the the uh, little bit of teaching I'll be doing on May 21st. Uh, you can get more information on that uh, at the uh, Washington Quantum Meetup Group site. So uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you very much for everybody for your attention and for your good behavior. We had no Zoom bombers tonight. Uh, so that's always a good thing. All right, guys, gals, thank you very much. Good night.